Okay, I think we are live. Hey there, how's it going? It is your muscle building coach, Lee Hayward, with the Total Fitness Bodybuilding live streaming YouTube video chat for Friday. What's the date? This is Friday, the uh, August 24th. And today what I'm going to focus on is covering the evolution of a bodybuilding program, starting from uh, a, a skinny teenager who's just getting started working out and how your program is going to have to evolve as you grow and as you mature and basically taking you through the full spectrum of a bodybuilding program. And this is something that I've had to deal with myself. Uh, I started working out back in 1990 at the age of 12. Went through you know the, my teenage years as a skinny teen, struggling to gain weight. Uh, made some really good gains throughout my 20s. That was kind of like the heyday of my you know bodybuilding competition days. Uh, continued making progress into my 30s, and then as I've gotten a bit older, of course, as I became a father, had to deal with some challenges, <laughs> as in not having enough time to dedicate to my workouts, not having enough time to dedicate to my nutrition, plus dealing with a slowing metabolism and having to change my approach. And now I'm in the phase of, you know, as I transition into my 40s, I'm at the other end of the spectrum where I'm fighting the battle of the bulge and trying to get leaner. So I'm going to take you through the whole journey of, a, of my bodybuilding program. And in doing so, hopefully share some tips and insights that you can use to help with your journey as well. So before I get into that, what I'd like to do is for those of you who are tuned in live right now, if you can hear me, if you can see me, if this is coming through loud and clear, please let me know in the video chat. Uh, of course, I always want to make sure that it's coming through before I actually get into, uh, you know, discussing the meat and potatoes of the content. So if you can do that for me, I would really appreciate it. And of course, I just have a couple little things to organize here on my end before I get into covering the content of today's show. Now, today's video chat is going to be a little different. Uh, I, I want to cover some of the stuff that I just mentioned. And I'm not going to be answering as many questions today because I have a lot of stuff that I want to discuss. But I would appreciate any comments that you would like to share about the things that I'm discussing. And I may take some questions at the end, but it's not just going to be a pure back and forth conversation like I normally have where I'm just you know taking random questions. Uh, I have had several conversations with people over the past week or so. I had a lot of new uh, you know, coaching students come on board. And this is something that I really want to address for the benefit of them and, of course, the benefit of you, the viewer, as well. So just uh, see. Got Woodulos is joining us, says coming through loud and clear. We have Jesse joining us saying it's loud and clear. Ian says it's all good. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much for that. All right, let's get into the meat and potatoes. I was actually having, just before I got on this, this video chat today, I had a discussion with a, a, a young guy. He's a teenager from Indonesia. And he actually signed up for a free coaching call with me. And that's something that I encourage you, the viewers, to do. If you would like some help with your fitness and nutrition program, uh, regardless of what level you're at, hey, I'm available. You just had to book a time in my calendar, and I'll be more than happy to sit down and have a conversation with you. You know, we could talk over the phone, talk over Skype, talk over Zoom, whatever type of <laughs> communication method is out there these days. We can have a conversation. And it's just an opportunity for us to chat, uh, for me to get to know more about you and to help you with your bodybuilding and fitness goals, be that building muscle, be that losing body fat, be that uh, some mental blocks that you may have, issues with being consistent with your program, whatever it is, we can discuss it and hopefully come up with some strategies. And of course, if I can't help you with any strategies, then I'll try and refer you to somewhere where you can get some help that you need to help further your progress. But anyway, I was having a chat with this young guy. He's 16 years old, just getting started, and he's frustrated with his lack of progress. And I can relate to this because as a teenager, nothing comes fast enough. I mean, I can remember back when I was a teenager, and I would be looking at the muscle magazines because this was before the days of internet and social media and stuff like that. So 
I'd be looking at the muscle magazines and looking at, uh, you know, books and, and videos, VHS videos that had bodybuilders and stuff. And I would always be comparing myself to those guys and thinking of, you know, I, I'm not making the progress. I always felt like I'm behind the eight ball. I, no matter what I'm doing, it's not fast enough. Now, looking back at it, you know, as a more mature person and, and realizing what was going on, I was actually making really good progress in retrospect. But at the time, as, a, as a, you know, an inpatient teenager, it didn't feel like it was happening fast enough. And I'm sure that a lot of you guys who've been around the Iron Game for many years can probably relate to this as well. You know, you at the time when you were younger, you thought everything was happening so slow. Now, as you gotten older, you'd be you'd be happy to be able to make progress at the same rate that you did when you thought it was slow as a teenager. So you just kind of have to kind of wrap your mind around it. Anyway, this particular guy, he's only been working out consistently for the past two months, and he's very. Um, disappointed with himself he's saying like I'm, I'm not making gains right he's he's only 121 pounds and he's frustrated because he's not making gains yet he's only been working out for two months and you need to really look at the bigger picture of what's going on here this is not a sprint to the finish it's not like you're going to do this miraculous 12-week transformation and, and this is something that that kind of pisses me off with with the fitness industry and the fitness media is people promote these big 12-week transformations, you know, the before and after challenges. And it's basically a marketing ploy. I mean, it's used by supplement companies. It's used by people who market fitness programs where they're trying to get you excited about the vision of making progress as quickly as possible. And I understand it from the business point of view because if you try and sell slow, steady progress over the course of many months, many years, it's not as sexy, it's not as glamorous, it doesn't have that same appeal, but it's real. And that's what I really wanna focus on, is, is what's real, what's attainable for most people. And this whole idea of you know a 12 week transformation where you're gonna start from zero and like in 12 weeks, you're gonna be huge, ripped and jacked. You know, for 99% of us out there, it ain't gonna happen. And for those, who do achieve this type of transformation, more often than not, they were probably in shape before or they're using the magic of trick photography for their before and afters. And this is, is, is something that happens a lot in the fitness industry. I mean, you can make a before and after look better or worse just based on how you position yourself. I mean, if, if you slump down and stick your belly out and have, have a depressed look on your face, you, you, you could look like crap. And then if you suck your stomach in, you hold yourself high and you have put a smile on your face, have better lighting, you can look phenomenally better. And it, it's, it's not anything changing with your body. It's just the magic of photography and how to make your body look better or worse. So a lot of times when you see these big miraculous before and after pictures, they're not always totally honest. Right? Sometimes there's a bit of uh, play going on behind the scenes there and people are just trying to it basically sell the sizzle you know they're not really selling any substance there they're just selling the sizzle so kind of look behind this over the smoke and mirrors if you will and realize that this whole process building a muscular body and developing yourself is is not a, a short-term solution it's not something that's going to happen in the matter of a few months and for that matter it's not really going to happen in a few years this is something that you have to dedicate your life to if you want to truly maximize your potential so for you skinny guys out there, you know, the teenagers who are watching this, I know I have some of you watching. I have a, a, a broad spectrum of people, for everybody from teenagers to people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and beyond. I mean, uh, some of my uh, followers, like even have a couple guys in on the uh, Total Fitness Bodybuilding Inner Circle who are in their 70s and beyond and still training and making gains in their 70s. So, I mean, it, it just goes to show that this is truly a lifestyle. It's not some quick fix solution that you're just going to do for a few weeks or a few months and boom. So anyway, I just want to kind of get into some of the actual how-to strategies of, of what you can do here. Uh, when I was a skinny teen struggling to gain weight, uh, one of the big things that uh, you need to really adopt is, first off, a consistent schedule for your workouts. 
And, and this is something that everybody needs to focus on, regardless of if you're a teenager or, or you know, you're working, you know, you're a student, you're a business owner, whatever. You need to have some sort of schedule in place. And for me, what I found worked the best was every uh, day after school was when I would focus on my workouts. And, and not necessarily every day, because I would have off days scheduled in there as well. But my training schedule was usually right after school. So before I got bogged down with anything else, before I got bogged down with homework or, or any family or social activities or anything like that, I would make sure to get in a workout. And it doesn't have to be anything crazy. Even an hour-long gym session is more than enough to make progress. And it doesn't even have to be a full hour. I mean, you, you can make gains in 45 minutes or a half hour, but I would usually allocate at least an hour. That gives you time to do your proper warm-up, uh, you do the exercise, do the workout, and then also have time to you know clean up afterwards. So I usually allocate an hour. And if you consistently do that on a regular basis, you can make some good solid progress. So that's one, having a consistent schedule in place. Find a time for you that works. And I mean, some people, it's first thing in the morning before they go to work or before they go to school. If that fits your schedule, then by all means do it. Uh, some people, it's going to the gym on their lunch break. If that works, go for it, do that. Uh, after work, you know, those are usually the key times for most people. But find the time where you can dedicate and try and be as consistent with that as possible. Uh, another thing that you really need to focus on is your nutrition. Now, it doesn't, one of the things a lot of people get confused and, and frustrated with, and then the gentleman that I was talking to earlier today had this issue, is he's working out consistently, but he finds it hard to follow a good nutrition program. And he, because he's not doing it perfectly, he's getting upset and frustrated with himself. So instead of, of thinking you have to be perfect, just focus on doing the best you can with your current situation. So, for example, if you are living at home with your parents, right? I mean, I've been there. I've been done that. And you don't have a source of income. You're just mooching off mom and dad, right? We've all been there. If you're still in that phase, then you really need to just make the best of your current situation. Chances are your parents are not bodybuilders. Chances are they're not going out and buying all the, the, the protein powders and pre-workouts and, and creatine and amino acids and all that kind of stuff. So you're probably not going to be using any supplements. And if you do, it's probably going to be very minimal <laughs> at most. Uh, the same with the diet. They're probably not stocking up on you know chicken breasts and, and lean beef and, and fish and, and all the, the high protein staples. I mean, yeah, you'll probably have some protein food with some of your major meals, like with dinner and stuff, but it's not like you're having six high protein meals a day. I know I certainly didn't when I was living at home. So just realize that in advance and do the best you can with your current situation. So uh, to give you an idea, idea of some of the stuff that I used to do, uh, when I was going through college, this is when I really made some of my best gains. But even, even earlier than that, when I was going to high school, I made some good progress as well. But some of the strategies that I did is every morning when I get up, I'd have a good solid breakfast. Now, usually that's not too hard for most people. You know, usually we, we have, in our normal everyday life, you have time for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Right? Those are your three main, three main meals. So if you can maximize those three main meals and then add in some uh, snacks in between those meals at appropriate times, you can still make really good gains. You don't have to follow the quote unquote six meal a day bodybuilding diet in order to make gains. So for breakfast every morning, I would just have usually something along the lines of oatmeal, uh, I would sometimes, if, if I had protein powder available, I would have like a protein shake with that. If I didn't, I'd usually have a couple eggs with it, but I would have some source of complex carbs, again, usually oatmeal, some source of protein, either a protein shake or some eggs or whatever was available. And then I'd also usually have some fruit, apple, banana, orange, something like that. So that would cover breakfast. For lunch, I would brown bag my lunch. And very often it was sandwiches, like a, a, lot, a staple of mine for, for years was something like a tuna sandwich. Uh, if we had some leftover meat or chicken or something like that, I'd probably make that like a chicken breast sandwich. But sandwiches were kind of my, my staple for lunch. And that's what I would pack for school. 
I'd also throw in some stuff like uh, nuts, like peanuts and almonds and cashews. I'd usually have a bag of mixed nuts. And this is great, especially if you're trying to bulk up because nuts are very calorie dense and they're very quick and convenient for snacking on. So for like recess, for lunch, you can have that. Uh, things like granola bars, again, not the most healthy food in terms if, if you're trying to lose body fat, but if you're trying to get calories in for bulking, stuff like this can really go a long way. Uh, fruit, apples, bananas, things like that, really convenient for packing with lunches. And that's what I would usually pack. So sandwiches and uh, some fruit and some nuts. And that would be my food for midday. Uh, when I'd come home from school, I usually have some sort of a snack. And usually I keep this light as I was getting more structured in my pro program it would usually be something like a protein shake and then i would do my workout and like i mentioned i have that schedule time right after school when i would do my workouts then after the workout would be dinner with the family and of course this was like the wild card whatever was on the menu i mean it, it could be a meat and potatoes type of dinner it might be spaghetti and meatballs it might be you know fish and rice who knows it really depended on what mom and dad were preparing for for supper that night but i would always have generous portions of protein carbohydrates and and whatever vegetables uh, one of the things that i used to do a lot of is eat fresh garden salads to get extra veggies in my diet my dad was was always a big uh, advocate of eating lots of fresh vegetables so usually every night for dinner we would have a big large garden salad before our meal so that would be like the appetizer if you would and then we'd get into the main course afterwards and then before bed each night i would have a bedtime snack uh, something like uh, cottage cheese uh, maybe greek yogurt maybe some fruit uh, maybe even like a, a some some bread or, or crackers or something like that to get some extra carbohydrates in there but again always trying to get a balance of protein and carbohydrates and that was a, a staple i mean it's nothing fancy but that was kind of like a staple diet plan that i followed for for many years now of course there'd be some variations i'd probably have different foods from time to time but i follow that same basic structure big breakfast solid lunch have a snack after school workout dinner with the family after that and then a bedtime snack and this fits in line with most people's schedule right because again if, if you look at just the regular schedule that most people follow you do have time for breakfast lunch and dinner and then it's not that hard to throw in a couple snacks in there as well uh, as i matured and got into competitive bodybuilding then of course i had to be a bit more structured with my program uh, focusing more on higher quality nutrition and less carbohydrates in order to help to optimize uh, you know, fat loss. So that's when I would be a bit more selective. And while I was going through college, I, I did some bodybuilding competitions and a sample diet that I would follow uh, when I was in my late teens, early 20s. This is like a, a bodybuilding pre-contest type of diet. Uh, breakfast would usually be oatmeal and egg whites. Uh, for lunch, I would have potato and chicken, and I would usually bake uh, some potatoes, and I have um, either boiled or, or grilled chicken breasts. So for my lunch at school, I would have, for, I usually have two breaks. So the way it was is one break, I would have a chicken breast and a small baked potato. The second break, I'd have another chicken breast and a small baked potato. After school, do my workout, and then after the workout, I would have dinner with the family. And of course, for that meal, I'd focus primarily on lean protein, green veggies, and keeping the carbs to a minimum. I would still eat carbs, especially in my late teens and early 20s, uh, but I would try and just control the portion sizes. So I wouldn't stuff myself with carbohydrates like I would as a skinny teen trying to bulk up and gain mass. Uh, then later in the evening, if I needed some more food, I would usually just have some protein, maybe like a protein shake or some solid fo solid food protein, like a chicken breast, uh, you know, maybe some cottage cheese or Greek yogurt, something like that. But I try and keep the carbohydrates to a minimum later in the evening. And that was a, a basic diet that I followed, uh, you know, in my early days of bodybuilding. And due to my fast metabolism, that actually worked really well. So, I mean, it wasn't 
an overly strict or crazy diet, but just the consistency with the workouts. And uh, in addition to that, I used to also do cardio on a daily basis. So the weight training workout would be every day after school, uh, every morning before school, I would do some sort of cardio. Uh, maybe it was doing cardio at home because we had a home gym at the time and we had, uh, you know, a, a stationary bikes and a treadmill and some basic cardio equipment like that in our home gym. Uh, other times I just get outside and, and go for a walk. I mean, that was, and still is today. One of my favorite forms of cardio is just getting outside and going for a walk. And that's something that I did on a regular basis uh, to help aid with fat loss, especially while I was training for bodybuilding competitions. As I matured and, and got into, you know, my late twenties, I found that that basic diet plan wasn't cutting it, wasn't cutting the fat either, right? I wasn't getting lean enough. So I got into a bit of a more advanced uh, diet strategy from that point on, and I would implement carb cycling. So how carb cycling works is I would have two days of high carbohydrate meals. So basically what I mean by high carbs is I would eat a serving of carbohydrates with every single one of my meals. Then I'd go two days with moderate carbohydrates. And for those moderate carb days, I would only eat carbs after exercise. So uh, for example, if I did cardio first thing in the morning, then I would have a serving of carbohydrates uh, for my post-cardio meal, which was usually breakfast. If I did weight training in the afternoon, then I would have carbs for my post-weight training meal, which at that time would be dinner. Uh, for all the other meals, I just focus on protein, green veggies, and some healthy fat. Things, again, like uh, some nuts or maybe some uh, avocado, uh, things of that nature. Uh, maybe even sometimes I'd have like a, a fresh garden salad with some olive oil on it. So it'd be just protein, veggies, and healthy fat for all my other meals, and not, not including the post-workout meals. So only carbs post-workout or post-exercise. And then I would go into two or three days of low carbs. And for those low carb days, every single meal would be just protein, veggies, and healthy fat. No starchy carbohydrates, no simple carbohydrates at all. So no, no starches, breads, pastas, or potato, anything like that. Uh, no fruit. I would just focus on protein and green veggies and then some, some healthy fat on top of that. And I would go through this cycle, the high, medium, low, high, medium, low. So two, two days of each, two days high, two days medium, two days low, and repeat the cycle. And I found that this was a much more advanced strategy and the benefit of this is that it helps you to optimize your metabolism. So you're refilling your glycogen stores on those high carb days. And then on the medium carb and low carb days, you're getting into tapping into stored body fat for energy so that your body can actually burn fat for fuel. But the, the kicker is, is you're not staying in this uh, low carb caloric deficit for long, because if you try and stay in a low carb caloric deficit for too long, your metabolism is actually going to slow down. And anybody who's ever followed a strict diet plan for a prolonged period of time can probably relate to this. You know, if you, you're following a program, things are going great for the first few weeks, and then all of a sudden it just doesn't seem to be progressing like it used to. And you're wondering, well, what's wrong? What am I doing wrong? I mean, I'm dieting strict. I'm not eating any junk food. I'm doing all kinds of cardio, all kinds of exercise. Why, why I'm not making progress? And what's happening is your metabolism will actually slow down to match your dietary intake. So if you always eat low calories, guess what? Your metabolism is going to slow down to match your low calorie diet. So by strategically cycling your calories with, with the carbohydrate cycle, going high, medium, and low, it helps to prevent this metabolic slowdown. So on those high carb days, filling out the glycogen stores, spiking your metabolic hormones, spiking your thyroid, your leptin, uh, all these metabolic hormones that help to keep your metabolism running fast, and then tapping into burning stored body fat during the medium and low carb days afterwards. And this strategy works really well. And this is usually something that I will start most of my personal coaching students with. So for those of you who are following along with me, you know, you're probably working with me one on one. Chances are I've recommended some variation of the carb cycle diet to most of you. 
Now, I mean, there are exceptions because I will customize it to the individual, but for the most part, I usually recommend this as a base strategy for most people because it works really well. You can usually make really good progress with the carb cycle diet for several months. Uh, as I got a bit older into my 30s, mid 30s, I found that my metabolism uh, was slowing down even more. So the basic carb cycle diet, even though it was it was producing results, it wasn't enough to get me from, you know, lean to contest shredded. So I would step up my game with even a more advanced version of the carb cycle diet. And what I would do uh, for my last several bodybuilding shows, and these are the ones that I actually got in my best shape. I mean, if you go through like my, my Facebook page and you go through some of the old uh, photo albums of my bodybuilding competitions, uh, the, the ones that I did in recent years were the ones that I got in my leanest condition. And the type of diet that I followed for those pro, for those contests was uh, primarily a low carb diet. So focusing on lean protein, green veggies, healthy fat for basically all of my meals. And then twice a week, I would have strategic high carb refeeds. Uh, for me, it was usually on Wednesday and Saturday. I would have these strategic high carb refeeds. The rest of the week was low carb, uh, again, focusing on protein, veggies, and healthy fat. And this strategy was uh, a bit more strict and, and required a bit more discipline and willpower to follow through, but I found that it worked really well, especially as I got older and my metabolism started to slow down. So this is something that I found worked really well. And again, it's an advanced strategy that, uh, you know, if, if you wanted to work with me on this, I could certainly help lay out an exact plan. In fact, uh, I have a program called the Extreme Fat Loss Program where it outlines meal by meal exactly how I follow this. And that's available on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Inner Circle members website. You know, a lot of people have followed that with great results. But that is the diet plan that I followed for my most recent competitions where I've actually gotten in my best contest shape. And that is, is definitely a program that I would recommend once the carb cycle diet plateaus. Now, what I'm currently doing now, and I find that it works well as, again, I'm getting older and my metabolism is slowing down even more, is I incorporate an intermittent fasting approach. So I'm still using the same basic principles uh, of, of well-balanced nutrition that I have for the other diet plans, but now I try and prolong the, the fasting period and minimize the feeding periods throughout the day. And I find that this works well, especially if you are older, and it works well if your primary goal is losing body fat or making lean gains. You know, for someone who's skinny trying to bulk up, I would not recommend intermittent fasting. Absolutely not. I don't think it's the best strategy. But for someone who's trying to control body fat, get leaner, then an intermittent fasting approach does work really well. And one of the benefits of intermittent fasting is it's it's very convenient because, I mean, it doesn't get any more convenient than not eating. You don't have to pack food and take Tupperware and, and all that kind of stuff because if you like are going to work or you're going to school or you're doing whatever during your fasting period, then it's very easy to fit that in. All you need to basically uh, take care of is your drinks. So things like water, which I'm going to have a sip of right now. Uh, I, I would drink zero calorie beverages, water, uh, black coffee, green tea, uh, of course, no, no sugar or milk or anything like that added to it, but just zero calorie beverages throughout the fasting period. And then during the feeding period is when you would have your meals. Now, I'm not a big fan of recommending intermittent fasting to beginners. And, and the reason for that is if you haven't developed solid eating strategies before, then getting into an intermittent fasting approach is just going to uh, exaggerate poor eating habits. So let, let's say, for example, someone, is, they don't have a structure to their diet. They basically just eat whatever they want, right? There's, there's no rhyme or reason. They just, if I'm hungry, I eat and I eat whatever I want. There, I don't have a clue in terms of my protein, carbs, fat, you know, I'm eating healthy food as well as processed food. Again, there's no rhyme or reason. That's the way most people are. So if you have no rhyme or reason to your diet 
and then you switch to an intermittent fasting approach, you're just going to basically still have poor eating habits. It's just stuck into an intermittent fasting feeding window. And you can still make progress like that, but it's not going to be optimal progress. So I usually recommend people start with a foundation of, you know, just following a, either a well-balanced diet plan, maybe following like a carbohydrate cycle diet plan that I mentioned, or even the more advanced uh, carb cycle where I recommended the, with the extreme fat loss program, but some sort of structured meal plan where you're developing better food habits, better eating habits, learning the basis of nutrition, learning how to count your macros, learning what foods are good sources of protein, good sources of complex carbs and vegetables and healthy fat, and getting used to eating that food on a regular basis. Then when you follow an intermittent fasting program, you still want to follow those same basic food principles. If you, I mean, it's, it's no good to starve yourself all day and then pig out on pizza and burgers and french fries at night. You know, I mean, that, that's not the ideal way that, that, you know, to, to lose body fat or to improve your health for that matter. But if you incorporate an intermittent fasting structure and then follow it up with good solid foods where you are eating lots of good quality protein, you are eating lots of good quality vegetables, uh, you know, complex carbohydrates in the right amounts as well as the healthy fats, then that's going to help to improve your overall progress. And of course, it's going to help to aid with fat loss in the process. So uh, that's usually the structure that I like to take people through when it comes to modifying and adjusting their diet plan. And of course, this is something that's going to vary from person to person, right? I mean, depending on your individual situation, uh, your individual goals, your body type, whether you are skinny and struggling to gain muscular body weight, whether you're overweight, struggling to lose fat, or if you're in the worst situation, you know, the skinny fat where you are skinny, trying to fill out your frame, but you also got a lot of excess body fat as well, then we really need to find an ideal strategy that's going to work for you and your body type. And that's where one-on-one coaching comes into play. And because it's, it's hard to offer like a one size fits all nutrition program to everybody because it doesn't work that way. We're all individual. We all have different metabolisms, different body types. So the program that may work for one guy is not necessarily the same program that's going to work for you, right? So you really need to kind of tweak it and figure out what's going to work for you at this stage right now. Because as I mentioned with my own training, it's evolved over the years. You know, the program that I followed as a skinny teen trying to bulk up if I ate like that now, I would become a fat pig, <laughs> right? And, and even the programs that I followed throughout my 20s, if I tried to eat like that now, I'd still probably become a fat pig. As I've gotten older, I've had to really kind of modify and control my diet and, and find ways to control my caloric intake so that uh, I'm losing body fat while still moving in the right direction towards my fitness goals. And this is an ongoing process. So it's not like you'll find one program and then that's probably the program you're going to follow for the rest of your life because your body is going to evolve and change. And that the same applies with your weight training as well. You know, the type of programs you're going to follow as a skinny teen trying to bulk up and build size aren't going to be the same type of programs you're going to follow as someone who's trying to lose body fat. And they're not going to be the same type of programs you're going to follow as someone who's, you know, 40, 50, 60 plus years old who's trying to improve their overall health, fitness, and mobility. Your body changes, your weight training and workout routine needs to change as well. And I'm going to cover some strategies about that. Um, When I was younger, I found that the best workout program for making gains uh, was to work out every other day. And, you know, when 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 I started off, I was very ambitious, you know, like a young kid full of piss and vinegar. And I just wanted to go to the gym and work out. I I loved the idea of working out. And sometimes I can remember going down to my little home gym and working out for two, three, even four hours at a time, thinking that the more I work out, the better gains I'm going to make. And I would go in there and like do total body workouts every day for hours on end. And even though I had the ambition, I had the motivation and the drive, and I even had the energy to to recover from those type of workouts. I didn't make gains following those programs. 
It was only when I started to follow a more structured program and actually allow time for rest, recovery, and growth that my body actually started to respond. So through trial and error and through reading different programs, I came up with a, a structure that worked really well for me, and that was basically working out every other day. So I'd do a workout one day, say like Monday, I'd, I'd work out. Tuesday, I would rest. Wednesday, I'd work out. Thursday, I'd rest. Friday, I'd work out. Saturday, I'd rest. Sunday, I'd work out, and so on. So every other day was a strategy that worked really well for me. And for, for guys who are struggling to gain muscular body weight, this has two benefits. Not only is it going to uh, allow your body time to rest, recover, and grow in between workouts, but it's also going to conserve calories. Because just think of it. You burn a lot of calories when you're in the gym weight training. And if you're struggling to eat enough food to be in a caloric surplus, uh, simply cutting back on your exercise volume is going to, in, a, in effect, put you in a caloric surplus. Let's just say, for example, you burn 1,000 calories per workout, right? I mean, that, that's just a, a, a round number I'm plucking from here. I mean, your actual calorie expenditure may be more or less depending on how much you work out, depending on how big you are and everything else. There's a lot of variables there. But just for the purpose of this example, let's say you burn 1,000 calories per workout. Well, if you're working out six days a week, that's 6,000 calories that you are burning just from working out alone. Now, let's say that you kept your diet the same. You know, you didn't make any changes with your diet, but all you did was cut back to working out three days a week. So now you are saving 3,000 calories that you're not burning through exercise. That is, an es is essentially putting you in a 3,000 calorie per week surplus that you wouldn't have if you were working out six days a week. So does that make sense? You know, just think of that. Like if you work out every day, you're burning a thousand extra calories every day. If you only work out three days a week, then you're only burning 3000 calories through working out. And essentially that's helping to put you into a caloric surplus. So simply cutting back on your exercise volume, especially for a skinny hard gainer is a way to actually help put you in a caloric surplus for growth. And very often you'll find that when you do this, you'll actually make better gains. And there's another benefit to working out less frequently as well, and that is you'll be more rested and stronger for each workout that you do. So instead of feeling like, you know, if, if you work out six days in a row, or even if you did like three days on, one day off, at the end of, of that stretch of working out, you'll probably start to feel a bit burnt out, a bit exhausted, and, and not able to give it 100%. You know, you probably have some delayed onset muscle soreness, and you're just not feeling fully recovered. But if you have a full day of rest in between each workout, then that gives your muscles time to re rebuild and repair, replenish your muscle glycogen, so that when you do work out the following day, or you know, 48 hours later, you are rested, recovered, and you can actually train harder and generate more force during your workouts and thus help to stimulate better gains. So if you are struggling to gain weight and you want to bulk up, the best training split that I can recommend is every other day. Now, I mean, you can play around with the exercises and the actual workout protocol. I mean, some people like to do like a total body workout. Some probably like to do a upper lower body split or maybe push pull legs. You know, they all work. There's pros and cons to all of them. But the, the big thing I think that's going to make the biggest impact is having the a full 48 hours rest in between each workout. If you do that then that's going to help to maximize your gains, especially as, you know, someone who's skinny and trying to bulk up and gain muscular body weight. Now, as you get the transition to burning body fat, the opposite applies, right? In, in order to help to burn more body fat, the more calories you can burn, the easier it's going to be to be in a caloric deficit. So you can see how this is going to change depending on the individual. So skinny guy trying to bulk up, hey, three days a week works great. Fat guy trying to trim down, I would do the opposite. I would recommend that they do some sort of physical exercise every single day in order to burn more calories and to help encourage fat loss. Now, it doesn't always have to be a hardcore, you know, bodybuilding workout program. I mean, it might even be, 
weight train one day, do cardio the next. Weight train one day, do cardio the next, and alternate it like that. But make sure that you're doing some form of exercise on a daily basis. Uh, ideally, strive for a minimum of one hour of exercise every single day, especially if you're trying to lose body fat and get leaner. That daily exercise is going to help to spike your metabolism and, and just encourage fat loss over the long term. So that is one strategy that works really well. And if you want to take it to another level, what you can do is do a daily or not necessarily daily, but say like five or six days a week of weight training combined with daily cardio. And this is what I used to do when I was training for bodybuilding competitions is every morning when I wake up, I would do an hour of cardio. And usually that was like get outside, go for a walk, maybe go for a bicycle ride. Uh, if the weather wasn't fit outside, I'd do cardio indoors, like either at home on uh, you know cardio equipment that I had at home, or sometimes I'd even go to the gym and use the cardio equipment there. But Bottom line, an hour of cardio, and this was primarily low-intensity cardio. I mean, I wasn't running sprints or doing high-intensity intervals, but it would be, uh, I'd go at a fast enough pace that I would break a sweat and get my heart rate elevated, but not so much that I was gasping for air or struggling to complete the cardio. So it is low-intensity cardio, but it's not, like, I'm not scuffing my feet while I'm walking or anything like that. I mean, I'd still walk at a brisk pace. Or I'd still, you know, cycle at a brisk pace enough to elevate the heart rate, work up a sweat, and of course, you know, burn some fat and calories in the process. But I wouldn't be killing myself. It wouldn't be the point where I was gasping for air or struggling to complete the workout. So again, moderate to low, low to moderate intensity cardio for an hour a day, and then in the afternoons I would do a weight training workout. Uh, usually that was some form, some form of a bodybuilding split routine where I would train different muscle groups on different days. Uh, but I found that the combination of two workouts a day really helps to maximize fat burning because after you work out, your metabolism remains elevated for several hours. So if you do cardio in the morning, you spike your metabolism and get the fat burning happening early in the day. Then if you do weight training again in the afternoon, early evening, you spike your metabolism again to help encourage more fat burning throughout the evening. Now, I mean, you can switch it up if you prefer weight training in the morning and then do cardio in the evening, that works as well. But the idea of doing two workouts a day, one cardio, one weight training, is kind of like the double whammy approach for maximum fat burning. So for those of you who want to maximize fat loss and get as lean as possible, as quickly as possible, two workouts a day, one cardio, one weight training, and that's going to help to speed up your results. And uh, another reason why I recommend the low intensity cardio is because it's going to allow you to recover from your workouts without burning out and overtraining. I mean, if, if you were to do high intensity cardio and high intensity weight training, you're only going to be able to do that for a few weeks or so until your body is just physically burnt out and overtrained. You're not going to be able to continue that over the long term. But if you do low intensity cardio, and high intensity weight training, then it's kind of like the yin and yang approach to your workouts. You have a balance, low intensity cardio, high intensity weight training, and when you can combine them together, it's very complementary. Because during those low intensity cardio workouts, you're getting active recovery. I mean, you're still burning calories, you're still moving your body, uh, you're encouraging fat loss, but it's not stressing your central nervous system. In fact, it's actually, physically and mentally relaxing, you know, especially if you can get out somewhere, like go for a walk in nature, go for a walk in the park or a walk along the beach or something like that. It's a great way to physically uh, do some activity, but it's relaxing. So you're, you're getting active recovery through the low intensity cardio. And then when you go to the gym for the weight training, that's when you're pushing yourself with some high intensity weight training. And in order to make that work over you know, like say like a five or six day per week workout split, uh, I would recommend dividing up your body parts. So that's where the, the whole bodybuilding bro split of working different muscle groups on different days can really help. Because if you try and do like a total body workout five or six days a week, you know, uh, unless you've got really good recovery or you're taking some, you know, super supplements to help enhance that recovery, chances are you're going to burn yourself out from, from trying to do, you know, big heavy lifts five or six days a week. So you, you need to 
to break that down. And that's where a bodybuilding split routine can help. So there you go, guys. I mean, that's kind of like the, the evolution right there of, of how to train for your different uh, situations, whether you're bulking or cutting. Um, and, you know, you, you can apply this for, for any situation for that matter. Um, oh, one thing I forgot to mention. As you get older, I know we've got a lot of, of, of uh, older guys tuning in. And when I say older, I'm talking like 40, 50, 60, somewhere in that range. As you get more mature with your workouts, you're probably going to notice that you can't handle the same volume or the same intensity as you did as when you were younger. I mean, I, I noticed this myself. When I was in my teens and when I was in my 20s, I could work out and recover from those workouts. Like I mentioned, when I was a you know, skinny teen trying to bulk up, I'd sometimes work out daily for two, three, or four hours at a time. And recovery was never an issue. I couldn't handle that kind of recovery. As I've gotten older, you know, in my 30s, now approaching my 40s, I don't have the same recovery that I used to. So what I usually do now is I will alternate weight training one day and cardio the next weight training one day and cardio the next. And I find that, again, it's the yin and yang approach, like I mentioned, the high intensity weight training to stimulate muscle, then the low intensity cardio for active recovery and fat burning. And the alternating of those in that fashion, cardio one day, weight training the next, I find it works really well uh, for a more mature lifter because what you'll find is you don't only need to give your muscles a chance to rest and recover, but you need to give your joints, tendons, and ligaments time to rest and recover. I mean, sometimes your muscles may be recovered from the weight training workout, in in meaning that you don't have any muscle soreness or anything like that, but your joints, tendons, and ligaments may not be fully recovered. And this is what often happens for a lot of older lifters is they find that their joints cause problems. You know, their shoulders, their elbows, their knees, their hips, uh, you know, all these big major joints is what's hindering them from training to their full potential. So factoring in recovery days for your joints, tendons, and ligaments is just as important. Another thing that you really want to focus on is mobility exercises. The older you get, the more time you're going to need to spend on warming up and mobility in addition to your actual weight training workouts. And the cool thing about mobility and stretching and stuff like this is this is something that you can do even on your off days from weight training. You know, if, if you have like shoulder problems or elbow problems or knee problems, it would be a good idea to do some light mobility exercises on a daily basis for those exercises, help improve blood flow, improve circulation, and to prevent those areas from getting stiff. You know, I mean, to the whole adage of if you don't use it, you'll lose it. That applies to your mobility as well. So if you have any joint or mobility issues, then I would definitely recommend getting a, a basic mobility routine and doing that on a daily basis, especially for your trouble areas. And it doesn't have to be anything too elaborate. Even five to 10 minutes a day will work wonders for improving that mobility and flexibility over the course of you know several weeks, several months, and then on into your later years. So hopefully that helps, guys. I know it's kind of just like a dump of information that I, I just wanted to share there with you because I had all these these questions coming in. So I, I, obviously this this whole replay is going to be saved and posted up on the, the YouTube channel. So this is going to be a good one for for people who kind of want that that big picture overview. Like how, how does the whole process of bodybuilding and nutrition work in the greater scheme of things. And I really tried to jam it all in here in this video chat. Now, I know there's probably a shit ton of questions coming through here uh, as I'm explaining some of this stuff. So what I'm going to do now is kind of skim through and, and do a bit of a, you know, cover some of the questions that came through. Uh, I'll do this in rapid fire because I know we, we've got a long time here and I don't have time to really go through each individual question in detail, but I will... Uh, I will cover some of them. So we have Sean's joining us. Uh, oh, Orang is joining us. Asking some questions about skinny legs. Actually, instead of just addressing that one question, I'm going to cover uh, addressing stubborn body parts because this is something that I didn't cover. 
if you want to prioritize your training around stubborn body parts, like let's say your arms are a stubborn body part or your legs are a stubborn body part or your calves are stubborn, whatever it is, whatever body part you find legs behind for you, one of the strategies that you can implement is to double up the frequency of those workouts. So for example, with, um, you know, let's just say that this guy, uh, Orang, says that his legs are stubborn. What I'd recommend you do is train your upper body once a week and train your lower body twice per week. So however you want to structure it in your workout split throughout the week, I mean, again, if it's an every other day program or whatever, set it up in such a way that you're getting two leg workouts for every one upper body workout. And by doing this, you're going to prioritize your body's uh, recovery abilities to help building up that, excuse me, help building up that stubborn body part. And this is something that I've used over the years to help work on stubborn body parts. So, I mean, you can back off the intensity, back off the volume for your stronger muscle groups, and then double it up for your stubborn body parts. And over the course of several weeks and several months, it will make a difference. So th that's what I'd recommend for that. Uh, someone's asking, this is Jesse asking about a total body routine. If you're going to do total body workouts, which, which are great, by the way, I mean, I, I'm a fan of total body workouts and I will cycle them into my routine from time to time. What I'd recommend is if you're following a total body routine, you need to train every other day. So you need to have at least one full day of rest in between each total body workout. And again, not only to rest your, your central nervous system, but uh, also to let your joints, tendons, and ligaments recover as well. So if you are going to do total body workouts, uh, a three-day-per-week routine works well. And then if you want to keep active on those off days from weight training, that's when you can throw in some low-intensity cardio to help keep your, uh, your body active and aid with fat loss. Uh, uh, Azim's got a question about the inverted row. It says, when we row, we bring the barbell to our belly, but our inverted row, we're bringing our upper butt, bringing the body towards the lower chest. Um, you can still, even if you're doing an inverted row, and I, I often refer to this as a body weight row, but um, you can still target different areas of your back with that exercise. And how it works is where you place your feet. Uh, if I'm doing an inverted row, I very often like to set it up in a Smith machine because I like to put a Smith machine at about waist height with the bar, and I find that uh, that's a good place to, to position it. And, of course, the Smith machine bar is very solid. And then I will use a flat exercise bench and rest my feet on that flat exercise bench. Now, if you want to target more of the lower lats, then you would just slide the bench closer so that your feet are are higher and that you're actually rowing lower. So you can still target different areas of your back with an inverted row, just the same as you could with a, uh, a barbell row. It just depends on how you position your feet and how you set up for the exercise. I mean, you could even do that with the reverse grip as well. So just experiment with it. But again, you know, you have, you have freedom of, of movement and how you position your body. So if you want to target more of the lower lats or the upper lats, it all depends on how far you position your feet away from the barbell, and that's going to depend on what area of your back that you work. Uh, Mandeep is joining us, uh, asking about pre-workouts. That's really optional. You know, I, I know some people love pre-workouts, some people hate them. I'm kind of in the middle. Uh, usually, my pre-workout of choice is just a strong cup of coffee. I find that it works well for me, and it, it's it's enough to give me a little bit of that caffeine kick to get to the gym and have a good training session, but it's not too much to cause me to feel jittery or, or, or to suffer a big crash afterwards. Because one of the problems, if you take like a high potency pre-workout, sometimes you'll get jacked up, right? I mean, you got all this, I mean, there's a shit ton of caffeine in it for one, but there's also other stimulants and ingredients in there as well that'll sometimes get you amped up and jacked and you'll feel phenomenal 
or, or maybe even jittery <laughs> for two to three hours. And then afterwards, it's just like you crash. So that, that's one of the drawbacks with pre-workouts. So uh, rather than having that, you know, big spike and then big crash, I like to have just a little moderate spike, you know, again, a, a cup of coffee. I find that that's just enough to, to get me through without overdoing it. And if you are going to use pre-workouts, be conservative with them. I mean, don't take, you know, the full dose for a lot of them because, I mean, some of them are, again, it's just overkill. Uh, if, if you're not a coffee drinker and you want something else, even even a caffeine pill, you know, something simple like that might be more than enough in terms of pre-workout in order to help you with, uh, you know, just get the little mental and physical pick-me-up that you need to get to the gym and to get through a hard workout. But if you are going to use pre-workouts again, be, be conservative with them. More is not better. In fact, I would say less is better when it comes to pre-workouts. Uh, we have Leo is joining us. He says he's 55 years old. He's currently lost 26 pounds. Uh, he is 105, 540 pounds. He says he still has a bit of belly fat, but he can see his abs when he's flexed. Should he start muscle building or lose more weight? What I would focus on for, for someone like Leo, I wouldn't recommend bulking or cutting. You're 55 years old. So, I mean, you know, we have to be realistic here. You're not, you're not like a skinny 20-year-old kid who can pack on a lot of lean muscle. You know, I mean, at 55, your natural testosterone and growth hormone levels are on the decline. So uh, you have to be more realistic. And what I would focus on is recomposition. So something along the lines of like that carbohydrate cycle diet that I mentioned earlier, where you go through phases of high, medium, and low, uh, that would be a great strategy for building and burning. Because during the high carb days, you're going to provide a surplus and it's going to help to build muscle tissue, refill glycogen stores, and help spike your metabolism. Then as you transition to the medium and low carb days, you're going to go into a caloric deficit, help to uh, burn body fat, and then you're going to start the cycle all over again. So the carbohydrate cycle diet is probably something that I would recommend. And again, it's, it's a recomposition. It's a building and a burning program. And that's what I would focus on. That combined with improving your athletic performance in the gym. Focus on being consistent with the workouts. Focus on training with progressive overload and making gains in the gym. You do that followed with consistent nutrition, and over the course of the next several months, you'll find that you will tighten up and you will fill out. You can build muscle and lose body fat at the same time if you do it properly. Uh, where it gets confusing is when people are taking it to the extreme. And, and what I mean by this is you're, you're not going to get, say, like a, say a skinny fat person who's, let's say they're 150 pounds, they're skinny fat, and they say, I want to be 200 pounds and ripped. Well, you're not going to do that all in like a, you know, a one 12-week program or something like that. I mean, in order to go from like a skinny fat 150 pounds to a ripped and jacked 200 pounds, that is going to take years of training. And more often than not, you're going to actually have to bulk up beyond the 200 pounds and actually diet your way back down again. That's usually how it works for most bodybuilders. But for... People who want to build muscle and burn fats, you can still do that with proper diet and training. I mean, you're not going to physically gain a lot of size. In fact, you're probably not going to gain any size. But what you'll find is you will recomp your body. So you might lose, say, 5 to 10 pounds of body fat. And in the process, you might gain you know, 3 to 5 pounds of lean muscle. So overall, your body's probably going to stay, your body weight is probably going to stay the same or maybe even drop a little. But your body composition is going to improve through a little bit more lean muscle and less body fat on your frame. I mean, you're going to look better, feel better, improve your health by doing so. But again, you're not going to become like, you know, ripped and jacked 200 pounds. You know, you can't build that kind of muscle and lose body fat simultaneously. But you can recomp your body. So that's what I would focus uh, for Leo is, is recomping your body and forget this whole bulking, cutting nonsense. I mean, save that for like the skinny, skinny young guys who are really physically trying to fill out their frame. Uh, but as you get older, uh, it's better to focus on recomposition. It, it's better for your long-term health as well. 
Uh, Azim's asking, what's my opinion about goat and camel meat for protein? I've never eaten goat. Well, I've probably eaten goat, but I've never eaten camel before. We don't have too many camels running around Newfoundland. There's no camels running around Newfoundland. <laughs> um, so I've, I've never eaten this before. But as far as protein goes, like the, the different uh, meats, for the most part, one is equally as good as another. I mean, if you look at the different foods, like if you look at beef or pork or bison or whatever, in this case, goat and camel, lamb, different things like that, for the most part, uh, on a gram for gram basis, the nutritional profile is very similar. Because, I mean, it's, it's basically the muscle of the animal. And muscle has a very similar composition. I mean, some foods might be a little more protein dense or a little more fat dense. But overall, the nutritional profile of different meats is very similar. So if, if your bodybuilding diet calls for four ounces of beef, there's, there would be no problem for you swapping out four ounces of goat meat or four ounces of camel meat or four ounces of bison meat or whatever. It's still four ounces of meat. And in the greater scheme of things, you're still getting the same quality of protein and nutrients. So uh, again, I've never personally ate camel before. Uh, who knows? Maybe I will someday. Uh, but more often than not, different protein sources are, are interchangeable. Okay. Uh, we have Istvan is asking, would it be a problem if I called you from Hungary? So he's, he's looking to book a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me. Uh, that would not be a problem because we're going to do the call either through Skype or through Zoom or, or whatever. So, I mean, uh, we'll still just be having a chat over the Internet. Like, literally, before I got on this call today, I was talking to a, a, a guy over in um, – shit, where was he from? Drawing a blank here. I'm having a brain fart right now. Oh, my God. Where was it? Indonesia. That's where it was. Indonesia. Sorry. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, we, you, the, the the Internet makes the world a very small place. So it doesn't matter where you're located. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll just what we're going to talk through Skype or through Zoom or something like that. So, again, that's not going to be an issue. There's no long distance phone charges applying. That's what I, that's what I'm getting at. Uh, and if you want to do this, for those of you tuned in, if you would like to book a one-on-one -on -one call with me, just head on over to my website, leehayward.com, and up in the top menu bar, there's a link there called Coaching. Click on that Coaching link, and that'll explain the, the overview of my coaching program, and then that's where you can book a free 20-minute call with me. And these are legitimately a free 20-minute call. I'm not going to try and sell you something that you don't need or anything like that. We're just going to have a conversation, discuss you, your program, your situation. And if I can help you with coaching, then I'll, I'll suggest that to you. If I can't, there's nothing gained, nothing lost. I'm not going to try and force you to do something. I'm not, you know, it, it's, it's, there's no obligation or risk on your part to have a, a free coaching call with me. It's just an opportunity for us to chat. And if I feel that you're a good fit and that I can help you, then I will suggest, uh, you know, an appropriate coaching program for you and your needs. Uh, if, if we're not a good fit or you feel that it's, it's, you know, you don't need it or whatever, then fine. We'll just have a 20 minute chat and, you know, you'll, you'll still walk away with some strategies that you can use to help move you in the right direction towards your muscle building and fat loss goals. Uh, okay, let's move on. I'm going to just quickly skim through a bunch of questions here. Uh, the, the repetition ranges. We have Operation Truth asking, you know, what do you think of like four sets of 15 using progressive overload, blah, blah, blah. Um, I actually had a, another guy earlier today asking about repetition ranges. Quite honestly, you can build muscle in all the different rep ranges. You know, high reps, low reps, medium reps. The main thing is training with progressive overload, forcing your body to perform a greater amount of work than it did before. So if you're doing even like three sets of 10, but you're adding weight to the barbell on a regular basis and getting stronger with three sets of 10, you can still make gains. If you're doing five sets of five, you can still train in a progressive overload with five sets of five and make gains. If you're doing, you know, high reps, 15 reps per set, same principle applies. Uh, but a more 
advanced and more a better strategy that I find for the majority of, of workout programs is to structure your repetitions based around the exercise that you're doing. So for your big, heavy compound exercises, your squats, your bench presses, your deadlifts, your overhead presses, your, your rows, these big exercises, they tend to work better with lower repetitions. So something like a five by five program works really well for squats, benches, deadlifts, and overhead presses. Uh, for isolation exercises, things like bicep curls, tricep extensions, uh, you know, side lateral raises, leg extensions, leg curls, things like that. They tend to work better with a moderate rep range. Somewhere, you know, 10 to 12 repetitions per set usually works well for those type of exercises. For um, other body parts, say like your abdominals, uh, your calves, um, things like that, they work better with even higher reps. So maybe 15, 20, or even 25 reps per set. So I like to adjust the repetitions based on the movements that I'm doing. The heavier, more compound exercises, I more often than not will do lower reps. Uh, isolation exercises, I'll usually use moderate reps. And then for smaller body parts, you know, abs, calves, I'll do really high reps. And I find that generally that works well. Now, of course, there, there's going to be exceptions to, to all of this. Like, like sometimes you might follow uh, compound exercises for high reps, like the 20 rep squat program. Right. I mean, that that works as well, but you're still training in a progressive overload fashion. Uh, other times you might do isolation exercises for lower reps. But for the majority of people and like if we're just kind of like laying out a basic foundation program to get started with big exercises, low reps, isolation exercises, moderate reps. And then for smaller body parts, high, really high reps. Keep it simple. Just focus on being consistent. And uh, like I say. We can always adjust it as you go. I mean, you, if you follow that program for like the next six to 12 weeks and it works for you, then hey, ride that wave of momentum. Let it work for you. Then when your body hits a plateau and your results stall, then we can look into changing things up. But don't think too much into it. This is a problem a lot of people have is they overthink their program. They're trying to plan out everything before they get started. Like, I want to have the perfect program, the perfect diet, the perfect macros before I even start. And then they want to plan out, well, how am I going to modify that program when the perfect program that I haven't even started yet, when that plateaus, what am I going to do then? Like, don't think that far ahead. Just start now. You can always adjust it and tweak it as you go. Don't worry about being perfect. It, what's what's the, the, the book? Um, Ready, fire, aim. There's a book out there called Ready, Fire, Aim, and that's a good slogan, like ready, fire, aim. So, I mean, just get started and then worry about perfecting it as you go. Don't be so anal and meticulous about trying to have the perfect program, the perfect diet, the perfect macros, the perfect supplements, blah, 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 before you get started. Just get started. Even a half-ass shitty program done consistently will be much better and produce much better results than the most perfectly planned, well-structured program that's not even started, right? So think about that. Just get started and then worry about improving it as you go. Don't get hung up in the details and bogged down in the weeds. That's where a lot of people uh, struggle. And I mean, I get questions all the time. Well, what about this? What about that? And blah, blah, blah. And like, are you even working out? No, not yet, but I will once I get the perfect program laid out. I'm like, just start. I don't care if it's if you're doing it wrong at the beginning. Just start, and we can always work on improving it. Step one, get your ass to the gym. We can work on it from there. All right, let's move on. <laughs> uh, Mac is asking, is protein every three, every three hours the best for muscle gain? In some cases, it can help, but it's not a requirement. You know, you can still build muscle with less uh, meal frequency than every three hours. Uh, where the whole idea of, of feeding every three hours comes into play is if you are, are, are really like you're skinny, you're trying to gain weight, and you have a poor appetite. This is where small frequent meals can help. But if you are uh, overweight and trying to lose body fat, then that can sometimes actually hinder your progress. So 
the whole idea of eating every three hours is not like some universal rule that applies for everybody. You can still make progress eating less frequently than that. And depending on your situation, it, it might actually be advantageous to eat less frequently than that. But where the whole six meal a day thing comes into play is for people who are struggling to gain weight. So for example, if, if you're eating three meals a day and you're not gaining weight, well, then rather than trying to eat more food per meal, let's just add in another meal. You know, and then when that stops working for you, and you, rather than trying to eat more food per meal, let's add in another meal. So that's where the whole idea of these small frequent feedings come into play. Uh, and vice versa, for people trying to lose weight, I mean, if you were eating six meals a day, <clears throat> rather than trying to have six smaller meals per day, why don't we just eat less meals? So instead of six meals a day, let's cut it back to five. And then when that stops working, let's cut it back to four. And then when that stops working, let's cut it back to three and, and so on. So uh, you can manipulate your, your meal frequency based on what it is that you're training for, whether that's gaining muscle, losing body fat, or recompositioning your body. And again, if, if you have specific questions about this, hey, book, book a free coaching call with me and, and I'll be happy to discuss a, a plan for you, your body type, and your situation, right? I mean, right here on this live video chat, I'm, I'm kind of just giving that blanket approach for everybody because we have, you know, a, a very wide uh, spectrum of people tuning in, right, from all over the world, young, old, and skinny, medium, fat. I mean, we, we have people from all over the world, all shapes and sizes. So I'm just giving general overview. But if you want a specific program for you, hey, book a free call with me and we'll, 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 uh, we'll lay out a plan of action that's right for you. Uh, okay, what else we got? Um, Jay saying he's got a lot of chest fat. Uh, my doctor says it's fat, not breast tissue. Even when I was thinner, uh, you could see my ribs, but there was still chest fat. Any tips? Hmm. If you have stubborn body fat in an area like that, again, sometimes it's hormonal. But again, I'm, you said you went to your doctor and he determined that it is actually fat. It's not like gynecomastia or you know breast tissue. Uh, what I would recommend is prioritizing your chest training, not so much to build more muscle in the chest, even though that will happen, but to prioritize the training to increase blood flow and circulation and metabolic activity in your chest. The more metabolic activity you can create and the more frequently you can create it, the, the more likely it is that you're going to burn the fat in that area. It, it's It's kind of like spot reduction in theory, but it's not spot reduction. <clears throat> you still have to have the basis of fat loss in place, meaning you still have to be in a caloric deficit. You still have to be consistent with your, your training, your nutrition, your cardio, all that stuff has to be in place. But let's assume that you have all that in place. You know, you have a, a workout program, you have a cardio program, you have a diet, you're in a caloric deficit, you've got all those bases covered. Now, when you increase the frequency of your chest workouts, it's going to create more metabolic activity in your chest and help to burn that chest fat. Now, this could be extra chest workouts at the gym, or it could be even ch extra chest workouts at home in your spare time. And the great thing about chest is it's so easy to do extra chest workouts because you don't even need to go to the gym. You don't even need any exercise equipment. You just need to get down on the floor and do push-ups. Push-ups are one of the most underrated chest exercises you can do. And you can do them anywhere, anytime, because, again, you don't need any equipment. You just hit the floor, boom, rep out with your body weight, boom, boom, boom. Do push-ups, and that will help to increase that metabolic activity in your chest. So what I would recommend for you, Jay, is every morning do at least one or two sets of push-ups. I mean, I, I don't care how many reps you can do. Do as many reps as you can with good form. One or two sets every morning, and then every evening, do another one to two sets. Again, get a, just get a good pump in your chest. That's all. It doesn't have to be you know, a, a big, long, elaborate workout. You don't have to kill yourself. It's just a couple sets in the morning, a couple sets in the evening, and the idea is to get some blood flow and circulation into your chest. Just a light muscle pump twice a day 
in addition to going to the gym and doing your regular body part workouts, which also include chest workouts as well. If you do that on top of your regular routine, that little bit of extra metabolic activity is going to help to speed up fat loss in your chest. You know, it it's kind of sounds like spot reduction, and in theory, it kind of is, but it does work. And I've used this strategy for different coaching students for, for various reasons. Uh, for example, a lot of uh, female uh, athletes, they have str str trouble losing lower body fat, you know, in the hips and thighs. And very often the, the strategy to lose that extra fat in the hips and thighs is to increase the volume of their lower body workouts. So uh, more metabolic activity in these areas to help speed up fat loss. But it's only going to work provided you're already doing all the fundamentals of fat loss, meaning consistent training, consistent cardio, and being in a caloric deficit. If you have all that in place first, then you do the, the spot reduction training after that, that's when you're actually going to see some results from it. If you just try and, you know, do spot reduction training without having the fundamentals in place, you're basically wasting your time, All right? That's the, the, like the adage of the fat person saying, oh, I want to lose my belly fat, so I'm going to do 100 sit-ups a day. Meanwhile, they're, they're eating burgers and fries, and, and, you know, they don't have any other structured program other than 100 sit-ups a day. Well, that's not going to do diddly squat. But if you have everything in place and then do frequent ab training, then you'll see some progress. All right, let's move on. Uh, a couple more questions here, and then I'm going to clue it up for the day. Uh, okay. Uh, would you suggest fish oil for powerlifters? That's from Adaptive Android. I'd suggest fish oil for anybody. You don't have to be a bodybuilder, powerlifter. Anybody can benefit from a good high-potency fish oil supplement because it's a good source of omega-3s, and everybody... I don't care if you're young, old, working out or not, needs omega-3s. So I would recommend a good quality, high-potency fish oil supplement for everybody. Uh, Amtins is saying, what do you think of Monday, upper, Tuesday, cardio, Wednesday, lower, Thursday, cardio, Friday, upper, Saturday, cardio, Sunday, off. So that's upper, I mean, Monday, Wednesday, I mean, hey, a, a upper, lower body split with cardio on your off days, that's a great program to follow. I mean, bottom line, don't overthink it. Do it. Try it. See how your body responds to it. If it works, stick with it. If it doesn't, we can always modify it later on. So you don't need to ask my permission to do it. Just go ahead, try it, see how your body responds, monitor your results, and we can adjust it accordingly if needed. Um. All right, uh, Sean is joining us. He says he's 51. He's doing a lean bulking program, eating mainly clean foods. He says he's eating 40% carbohydrates, 30% protein, 30, sorry, 40 carbs, 30 protein, 30 fat. And it seems that the more carbs I eat, the more tired I tend to feel with lowering my carbs and raising my fats help. Um, it might. It might. Now, it also depends on the type of carbohydrates you have as well. Like certain carbohydrates can uh, spike your insulin levels and actually lead to like a, you know, like a little sh sugar high and then the sugar crash. And, and sometimes it's even foods that you wouldn't think. Like, for example, rice is a very high glycemic carbohydrate. I'm not saying that it's necessarily a bad one because there is a time and place for high glycemic carbs in a meal plan. But uh, rice, pasta, uh, foods like this can sometimes spike your insulin, spike your blood sugar, almost to the same extent as if you were eating the same amount of carbohydrates from, from sugar. Uh, so be a bit more selective and try and select lower glycemic carbohydrates. That can help to stabilize your energy, stabilize your blood sugar. Uh, some great sources of, of low glycemic carbohydrates, things like beans and legumes, um, oatmeal, you know, sweet potatoes. Uh, some things like that, which are lower on the glycemic index, can help to stabilize your energy. And another strategy that I would recommend is try and go for 
a third of your calories from protein, a third from carbs, and a third from fat. Try and have that one third balance. Uh, and I don't mean in terms of grams, I mean in terms of the actual calories. Because again, protein has four grams per, per, four calories per gram. Carbs have four calories per gram. Fat has nine calories per gram. So you'll need to adjust the, the macro numbers accordingly. But try and get a third of your calories from protein, a third of your calories from carbs, and a third of your calories from fat. And that is, I find, the best ratio for most people because it gives you that balanced nutrition. You usually don't suffer the, 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 the drawbacks of a low-carb diet. Uh, you don't suffer the drawbacks of a low-fat diet and all this kind of stuff. It just gives you that well-balanced uh, source of nutrition for sustained energy. And it, it, most people's body will function very well on a well-balanced macro split like that. Uh, so even out your macros and focus more on the low glycemic carbohydrates. And I think that should help. Uh, we have Christos is asking, what movies do you watch? Um, I, I honestly, I don't watch a whole lot of movies. Uh, I tell you what, I, I'm if if I am going to watch TV, I, I like getting into some uh, the the sh TV show series on Netflix. I, I like doing that. Uh, some of my shows that I, I've watched and I've really enjoyed, and I've watched the full series of them. Uh, Suits, I like I like the 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 show Suits. Uh, Breaking Bad, I've watched the whole series of Breaking Bad. Uh, Better Call Saul, I like that one. I watched all those. Uh, some of the Marvel comic ones, like Luke Cage, uh, Daredevil, Iron Fist, some of those Marvel comic ones, I like those, and I've watched the whole series of those on Netflix. Um, oh, shit, what are some others? Stuff like that. I like the TV shows uh, rather than movies. Like, that's usually what we will watch if, if, if we're going to enjoy TV. Rather than watching movies, I usually get into the TV show series. And I actually enjoy it more because you get to to follow along and know the character, and it just the story pro is a prolonged story versus if you watch a movie, it's it's done and over within two hours. But if you're watching a TV series, you know you get to see the character f for that series, and you get to follow along with their journey and their struggles. And I just I don't know I just find I get more into it, sucked into the story that way. But that's usually if if I'm going to watch TV, that's what I'll watch. Uh, if we're going to go to the theater to watch, it usually has to be a big production type of of something for me to go to movie theater. Like if, a, if the new Star Wars movie comes out, yeah, I'll probably go to the movie theater to watch that. Uh, you know, so something big with you know special effects and stuff like that. I'll go to the movie theater to watch it. Um, if it's just a you know some story movie no big special effects i'm not going to waste my time going to the movie theater to watch that it's usually a big big grand movie uh, again like a new star wars movie or a new gladiator type movie or something like that i'll go to the theater to watch it other than that i'm just going to watch shows on netflix <laughs> and uh, i don't do a lot of it i mean usually you know sometimes before going to bed in the evening i'll watch a show like that but uh, since uh, Harvey's been born, and since I've been trying to step up my game in terms of working out more consistently and everything else, I usually don't have a lot of time for uh, for, for TV watching. And if you are pressed for time and you're looking, you know, how do you make time for your workouts? Cutting out TV is one of the biggest things you can do to make time to go to the gym, right? So if, if I'm going to cut back in, in other areas to make time for, for workouts and nutrition, the TV is one of the first things to go. All right, I'm going to answer another question or two, and then I'm going to clue it up. Oh, shit, we've been way over an hour here, but that's okay. Um, Christos is asking, I bet I got a good question here. How much time would a good cutting phase last, in your opinion? Say you're at 25% body fat and you want to get to 15. Good question. Um. I, I really don't like going by percentages so much because body fat percentages are not always accurate, right? Like depending on the method of body fat testing you use, you can get different readings. Like if you use a skin full caliper versus like an electronic body fat tester versus like underwater weighing or DEXA scan or whatever, 
you're probably going to get a different reading from all these different tools. So what I prefer to do for practicality is instead of getting hung up on the body fat percentage, uh, I'll take like my skin fold caliper and I'll just measure my skin fold thickness. So I'll probably measure like on my stubborn areas, like usually on the, the love handle area above the hip, uh, right alongside the navel, right next to your belly button. That's another stubborn area for most guys. We tend to carry it around the belly. Uh, so I'll measure though the skin fold thickness at the belly button and at the hip. I'll also take a circumference measurement with the tape measure. So I have my belly circumference. And I'll use that for tracking my progress. So rather than getting hung up on the body fat percentage, I'll just focus on those things. And as long as I'm seeing progress on a regular basis, like every couple of weeks, the skin fold measurement's getting thinner, or every couple of weeks I'm losing like, you know, a, an eighth or a quarter of an inch around my, my midsection, then I know I'm, I'm moving in the right direction. And of course, tracking your body weight on the scale as well, because generally as you're losing, you know, skin fold thickness and losing circumference in the midsection, you should also be dropping body weight as well. So as long as all those things are happening, uh, then I know I'm moving in the right direction. But as far as, as a realistic time frame, give yourself a lot of time when cutting. Uh, in my case, back when I was competing in bodybuilding competitions, I would give myself six months to transition from off-season bulking to contest shredded. Six months. And I found that I needed that much time in order to make that transition. If I tried to rush it and do it in less time, I usually got subpar results. The longer you diet, the generally the better results you're going to get. And one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of people make when it comes to fat loss is they overestimate how hard it's going to be, but they underestimate how long it's going to take. So be prepared to invest the time. I mean, I, I get a kick out of it every now and then. I'll, I'll get emails from people and they say like, oh, I'm going on vacation in two weeks. How, how can I lose my belly fat in two weeks? And I say, I, I, I sometimes I, I almost don't even want to reply because it's, it's like a waste of time. Like you are not going to make any dramatic changes in the matter of two weeks or even in the matter of a month. I mean, unless you're already to the point where you basically got visible abdominal definition and you just kind of want to like peak. But if, if you've got a roll of belly fat hanging over your, your waistline and you, you say, okay, how do I lose this in two weeks? Forget it. It's, it's impossible. I mean, you know, liposuction <laughs> be probably the only solution at that stage, but you need to give yourself time. And I would recommend for most people, if, if you're looking down and you got like, you can pinch the roll of belly fat hanging over your, your waistline there, six months. That's a good realistic time frame for most people. If you want to go from fat to lean, give yourself six months. And uh, so there, that, that's my answer to that one. Um, all right, there's, there's a little, several questions coming through here. A lot of them are you know kind of repetitive or just talking about what I've already discussed earlier in the chat. Uh, but I'm going to get ready and clue this up. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video chat. Again, for those of you who are probably just tuning in right now, we covered a lot. Back in the beginning of this video chat, I covered an entire overview of how to transition from a skinny teen who's trying to bulk up to someone who's in their 20s and 30s who's trying to make some lean gains and fat loss to someone in their 30s, 40s, and beyond who's try now trying to fight the battle of the bulge. And I kind of used my own story as an example. So we went through the whole evolution of bodybuilding from a beginner to intermediate to advanced to a senior who's trying to maintain health and mobility as they age. So I covered a lot of stuff here, and I'm going to organize it in timestamps. So I'll, I'll get that done for you. But you want to go back and watch this replay if you're just tuning in live right now because uh, there was a lot of information covered here. So hopefully you enjoyed this. Hopefully you found this beneficial. And if you do have any questions or comments or anything like that, feel free to send me an email or a private message or, or head on over to my website at leehayward.com. And we can even book a one-on-one -on -one coaching call together to discuss some strategies to help you maximize your own personal muscle building and fat loss goals. So again, hopefully you enjoyed it. And I will talk to you uh, next Friday. Take care. Over and out.